Thanks very much. Um, thank you for coming as well and taking the time. Um, maybe just by way of introduction, uh, I'm a language teacher and teacher trainer. Um, I've been based in Krakow for the last 12 years. Um, I don't claim to know everything there is to know about language teaching. Um, uh, I'm sure there are some people here who know a lot more than me. Uh, if you can understand what I'm saying, you will most certainly know more about learning a language than I do, uh, as your English is far superior to my Polish. Um, at the end, if anyone has any questions and they want to ask them in Polish or in English, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, unfortunately, I have to run away at 7 o'clock because I have to go and put my two sons to bed. Um, hopefully, I won't make a mistake and put all of you to sleep and wake them up. We'll see. Um, so, uh, as Wukash said, the, the main topic of this, uh, this lecture, I suppose, um, is looking at how languages are taught and perhaps exploring how they can be taught better. Um, the somewhat pro provocative title of why well, probably everything you were told about learning a language is wrong. Uh, yeah? Would you like me to speak up or? Yes. Okay. So I'll put that away. Because if I should be able to do one thing as a teacher, uh, I should be able, hopefully, to uh, project my voice to such an extent that you'll be able to hear. Um, so today's, today's lecture is concerned with what you know about teaching and what you know about learning, and why perhaps new discoveries and new findings uh, connected to language may cause for us to change the way that we teach. Okay? Um, to begin with, I'd just like to go over some of the main ways that perhaps you may have learnt English in the past, or you may have learnt other languages in the past, and to explore maybe the theory behind them. Uh, in order to do so, I would need to have my presentation back. So maybe I'll begin and we can follow up with the pictures, the pretty pictures in a minute when they come back. Um, so perhaps the, f the first and kind of main uh, theory that came about in the 1950s would be connected with behaviorism. Um, so from this we have today, for example, the Callan method of teaching. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Callan. Um, and also, if you've ever listened to uh, or done one of these ways of learning a language where you listen through headphones, you repeat, and then magically you're supposed to be able to speak the language. Um, unfortunately, it's not really that simple. And there tends to be a lot of confusion. Um, when people first learn a language, um, it's almost as if you have a completely empty glass. And anything that you add to that glass makes it seem a lot fuller. The more advanced you are, if you add the same amount of information, it doesn't really seem like you've learned a great deal. Um, and the Callan method, unfortunately, is very good at this. It's very good at you getting to say very basic things very quickly. Okay? Uh, it does this through repetition, uh, and it does this through very formulaic uh, and repetitive um, input. This is very exciting. Um, originally, the Callan method was uh, developed to teach uh, American Marines how to communicate in Korea. Um, so it doesn't necessarily engage your brain a great deal. Uh, and I, I think we really if we uncover what's, what's behind it, this, this basic mechanism of behaviorism, I think we can safely say that there's more to learning a language than simply repetition. Um, it's largely re been replaced nowadays with communicative language teaching. Um, now, communicative language teaching is what you'll encounter in most schools in Krakow. Um, you'll be familiar with certain things such as sitting in a horseshoe, <coughs> as it's called, uh, working with a partner or working in groups. Um, the emphasis is on the ability to communicate a message uh, and really not so much on your, uh, the content of your utterances, but whether or not you can get something done. The problem is, is in communicative language teaching is it's not always like this. Um, I certainly know from my own experiences of learning French um, that the way we were taught, we were taught the same kind of things, regardless of whether or not they were things that we needed to know or we needed to be able to do. So until my dying day, I will know how to say, I play tennis in French. Je joue au tennis. I don't. I never have done. I never will do. It's not a particularly exciting game, for me anyway, for some of you possibly. Um, but this is something that was taught, 
because it's very easy to teach. It's very easy to teach things like, so what are your hobbies? I don't have hobbies. I have two small children. That's more than enough. Uh, some people do have hobbies, but the vast majority of us don't. Okay? We have passions. We have things that we do. We have things that we're interested in. Um, but the kind of language that communicative language teaching teaches us is not necessarily useful for communication. And this is, the, this is really the, the problem. Um, how are we doing? Okay. So maybe I'll wait until we're just plugged in. Ah, brilliant. Um, so just to recap, behaviorism. This is very often the standard formula that we, that we have. So you listen, you repeat, you understand. Sadly, no. Um, the thing that underpins communicative language teaching, and which probably contributes to its downfall, um, is a belief in universal grammar. Okay? Um, the idea that there are a certain number of properties which underpin every single language in the world. Um, this is something of a linguistic dinosaur. Um, not many people believe in it anymore. And it's really unhelpful. Okay? I'll come on to why a little bit later. Um, for starters, we we can't really be sure that there, anything, there is anything like universal grammar um, because we don't really have any access to most of the languages, not only that are spoken in the world today, but that have ever been spoken. Okay? Um, a survey estimated that we probably have something like 2% of the human linguistic diversity uh, that has ever existed. So how can we be sure on a sample of 2% that there, are, there is such a thing as universal grammar, OK? Um, there's an idea which is quite common that there are certain things which appear in all languages, um, that there are things like subjects and objects in all languages. Um, there aren't, OK? Uh, you can always find exceptions. Um, there are things which exist in one language which don't exist in others. There are, there are grammatical uh, structures which exist in one language but don't exist in others. Um, what we do have, and which is universal, um, is the ability and the need to communicate um, and to use language to do so. And this is what separates us from other mammals uh, and other entities. Um, the best analogy that I've encountered when it comes to language um, comes from Daniel Everett. Um, he's the man on the right. Um, he spent most of the last 30 years uh, working with a tribal group in Brazil called the Piraha, um, analyzing their language and uncovering some very interesting things about how they use their language and how their language functions. And at the same time, disproving an awful lot about universal grammar in the process. Um, whether you accept everything that he has to say is a different matter. Um, and sometimes he does like to be controversial just for the sake of being controversial and just for the sake of upsetting Noam Chomsky. Um, something which I approve of, but still. Um, one thing he does have, though, which is a, a very useful analogy, which I'm going to be using this evening. Um, and that's to view the various languages of the world in much the same way that we would view bows in terms of archery. Okay? Most human cultures have invented relatively independently different bows. Um, I mean, here we have a random sample. On the left, we have a, a medieval longbow um, of the type used by Welsh archers at the Battle of Agincourt. Um, you have a Scythian uh, horse bow towards the middle. Essentially, different shapes, different appearances, but a very similar function, shooting things. OK? Um, I mean, if we go a little bit deeper into the analogy, um, bows have different shapes. They're constructed in different ways. They use different materials. Um, some are made from, uh, from wood. Some are made from bone. Uh, some are even made from tusks uh, of different animals. Um, and they're used to hunt different things. Um, you can hunt with a longbow and with a bow anything from uh, a mouse, should you so desire, to an elephant. Um, this is true. I have pictures later. Languages, by extension, um, 
have different pronunciations. They have different sounds. They use different parts uh, of our, and our, our capabilities to produce different sounds. Um, this kind of mirrors the different shapes of bows. So they look different and they sound different. They differ grammatically. Um, they have different grammatical means and, and structures at their disposal. Um, they use different terms, and they're used for slightly different purposes, and they're used differently. Okay? Um, but they do the same thing. Okay? If there's any universality in language, it's that we do the same things with each other when we communicate. Okay? We talk about love, we talk about hate, we talk about things that we like to do on a Saturday afternoon. Okay? Um, the other key part to the analogy is that the use and the use of a language has then had a kind of a reflexive relationship um, and has helped to shape the language itself, depending on how it's used. Um, so as we can see from the pictures, two very different types of bows. Um, one, uh, Howard Hill uh, developed to, uh, he heard a story that the, uh, a group in, uh, hold on. I get them confused. I think Liberia, but I could be wrong. Um, in Africa, uh, would hunt elephants using a particular kind of bow. Um, he thought this was intriguing. He set out, he found the designs, he found the kinds of bows they used, and he went out and in the 1950s, a less politically correct time, shot and killed an elephant using a bow. Um, the example at the bottom is a Swedish crossbow um, used by mounted Swedes during the deluge. Um, different uses for shooting different things for different targets. They differ in terms of their appearance, but they're united in the fact that they perform a similar function. They're used for shooting things. Okay? This applies not just between languages, so between Polish and English and French and Spanish and Swahili, um, but also within languages. Um, so depending on who we're talking to, the variety of Polish or English that we use, okay, it also has a different purpose and a different function. Um, just to kind of clarify the distinction, because the key is, and this is an old point, this is something which you can go back as far as Wittgenstein, you can go back even further, that language is use. Um, the traditional view, uh, the view which I think is, is generally held by most people teaching today. Grammar is a logical, universal part of every language. Um, and so linguistics becomes something like anatomy. You're trying to uncover the bones of a language, okay, and to work out how things work when you put it all together. And so therefore teaching is a matter of identifying these different bones and identifying how they work together in order to speak a language. Language's use sees grammar as something different. Um, Grammar is really just the fossilized remains of things that people have said in the past and that people have kept on saying, okay? So linguistics and language is much more like archaeology. We're trying to uncover and remove the different layers of history to get back to what people were originally trying to say. Um, and so teaching is more of a matter of guided discovery. We're trying to uncover this. We're trying to uncover how things work, okay? Um, a, a simple example. Um, if you trace back the meanings of different words through history, you can see how they've varied and how they've changed. Um, but you can also, through that, understand a little bit more about how the language works. Um, for example, the word happiness in English, you can trace back to the Anglo-Saxon word hap. Uh, it has the same root as, for example, happen. Um, so basically, it's connected very strongly with fate. That happiness is nothing that we have any kind of control over. We don't control their destiny. We don't control their happiness. This is the, these are the roots of the term happiness. Um, nowadays, we are very much aware and we very much think that we're in control of our happiness. Through the choices that we make and through the things that we do, we can influence our happiness. Um, if we step back through history, this wasn't always the case. In ancient Greece, uh, there was an idea that you could only ever judge that a man or a woman was happy when they were dead. Uh, it's the thing which underpins, for example, Oedipus. Um, the, throughout the story and throughout his life, everything is wonderful and brilliant until the very end. Okay? So what does all this mean for teaching? Um, the idea that language is use. Um, first of all, 
we need to be aware that there are different uses and different needs, and therefore there are different languages that need to be taught. Um, uh, philosophy students, for example. Um, philosophy students need to be exposed to argumentation. They need to be challenged. Um, they need to have practice within a classroom, within a safe environment, of being challenged and of being argued with, being pushed, being pushed a bit too far. Um, this is something which is, which is key. Uh, when I teach philosophy students, this is how I am. This is what I do. I'm not naturally so dogmatic. I'm not naturally so argumentative, although my wife may disagree. Um, when I teach philosophy students, I feel that I have to be. Um, because when you're practicing philosophy, and as a philosophy student, this is something which is useful. When I teach bartenders, when I teach restaurant workers, uh, when I teach city guides, you don't need to be quite so challenging or at least in a slightly different way, perhaps. Okay? So the teaching method and the teaching manner needs to change to suit the group. Okay? It's not the case that one teacher teaches in a fixed way and in a certain way to every single student that they teach. Okay? You almost need, as a teacher, to put on a different face, depending on who you're teaching. The other thing is, is really connected with teaching how a language works. Um, now, English, some of you may have noticed, is a very indirect language and quite a, a sometimes absurdly polite language. So we don't say if we want to have something daimitan. Whenever I go into a shop uh, in Krakow, still after 12 years of being here, I don't just say give me that or can I have that. I will always ask about the theoretical existence of something in this shop. So I will go into a shop and I will say, just sukie może? Which in Polish is a very strange thing to do. Um, this is because I still don't speak Polish properly. I speak Polish like an English person would. Okay? I'm very indirect. Um, by way of example, um, uh, recently the Harvard Business Journal conducted some interesting research connected with how people uh, respond to strangers and in certain situations. Um, so they, they got a young man uh, dressed in a suit uh, to stand at a railway station uh, in America and to ask people if he could borrow their mobile phone. Um, if he just went up to them and said, can I borrow your phone, please? In general, 9% of people would let him borrow it. If he, his opening gambit was, I'm sorry about the rain, which is a bit of a ludicrous thing to say because it's not his fault. He's not in control of the weather. He hasn't caused it to rain. Then the success rate went up to 50%. Now, you could say that this is something to do with, uh, with bonding, with how we kind of make initial contacts between people. I would say it's also got something to do with how English especially is spoken and how English is used. Um, so if someone comes up to me and asks me if, I can, if they can borrow my phone, I don't know you from Adam. I might say yes, I might say no. If someone comes up and starts talking about the weather, then we automatically know where we're talking about because this, is, this accounts for something like 90% of all conversations in England concern the weather and when it's going to stop raining. So I guess the main point is, is, is really, it's a bit like the Ministry of Silly Walks. You, you don't just need to be able to talk the talk you also need to walk the walk. You need to be able to not just speak the language, but use the language in the, in the way that other people do. Okay? So you can know English inside out. You can know English grammatical structures perfectly. But it doesn't mean that you can speak English. Conversely, you can have a relatively poor grasp of grammar, but you can understand what you need to do in order to communicate uh, with a stuck-up English person, okay? Let's have a look at a few more, a few more consequences and, and misconceptions about, about learning, uh, not just English, but languages in general, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. First up, grammar is the most important aspect of language teaching. Um, this is not true at all, okay? Uh, Grammar is not that important. There's an awful lot that you can do without any grammar at all. Um, I could shout coffee, and I'm sure the person behind the bar would understand that I wanted a coffee. They might think I'm quite rude, 
but there's no grammar involved in that, in me saying coffee. Okay? And this is, no, this is in no way a, a new idea. Um, if we go back to Joseph Webb in 1622, um, who's an uh, educational reformer in the UK, um, no man can, can run speedily to the mark of language that is shackled with grammar precepts. So it's almost the idea that a knowledge of grammar is a negative thing. It forms this kind of barrier that makes us think that we can't communicate, that we can't speak a language properly, and so we don't. Uh, first and second language acquisition are fundamentally different. Um, so the way that we learn our first language and the way that we learn second languages is different. The mechanism is somehow different. This, I think, is one of the biggest misconceptions. Um, it's not the case. What happens is actually with the teaching. Okay, So this is Elijah, my youngest. Um, he's just at the really interesting stage where he's starting to use individual words because he's getting to associate a use with a certain word. So if he says up, he knows that he'll be picked up. If he says down, he'll be put down. Okay, um, So he's learning English and Polish simultaneously. Uh, and he's also using them interchangeably. So I use English and Polish with him, and my wife does the same. Um, the idea being that he will associate the use of the language. I suppose, as an aside, it's probably wrong to use your children as guinea pigs. Uh, but we'll see in 15 years. Um, so we use them both languages interchangeably. So he associates the, the terms from both languages with a concrete use. Okay? So when you all learnt Polish, you learnt by saying daimita would result in you getting something. Okay? When it comes to English, you have generally learned in an artificial environment. Um, you have learned in a classroom, or you've learned from books. So you don't necessarily have that very strong connection with use. Um, an example of my own, uh, pretty much all of my Polish has been formed by use and by need. Um, for example, I, I realized that I'd lived in Poland for four years without knowing the Polish word for light bulb. Uh, because I'd never had to use it, you know, because when you go to a shop, you can go into a supermarket, you can take a light bulb off the shelf, you put it in your basket, you go to the counter, you sometimes say hello, but you don't always have to, you pay, you leave. At no point do you ever need to use the word light bulb, okay? Until one day, all of the big shops were closed and I had to go to a small, a small shop to buy a light bulb, and I realized, uh, so because of that, everything I know about Polish is shaped by use. Um, another example, when I first arrived in Poland, I was mainly teaching young learners. I was teaching children. Children need to know words uh, which are immediate and which are useful to them. So I knew seven different types of tree before I could say where I lived in Polish. Because kids need to know, is this an oak tree or is this a beech tree? Um, Language is shaped by use. There doesn't have to be a difference between the way that we learn Polish and the way that we learn English. Okay? It all comes down to the way that it's taught. Um, another myth, I think. Um, you can't learn languages when you're old. Um, much of this can be attributed to uh, Stephen Krashen um, and the critical hypothesis, the critical period hypothesis. Um, this is the idea that uh, up until the age of 12, you can learn a language. After then, you might as well forget about it. The key word in this is it's the critical period hypothesis. It was an idea. It was never proven. Uh, and increasingly, it's being shown to be false. Um, age makes no, different if, makes no difference. Um, if anything else, because you have learned a language before, because you already know the concepts, all you then are doing is you're mapping words from a different language onto the concepts you already know. I've had to teach six-year-olds terms like biodiversity. They don't understand the concept in Polish. So how can you teach them a word in a language that they don't know? Uh, adults already know the concept. Uh, so all they're doing is mapping it onto a pre-existing scheme. Uh, you should sound like a native speaker. Um, I don't know why. Um, I don't know what this means. Uh, if you've ever been to the UK, if you've ever spoken to someone from Newcastle, um, I don't know why anyone would like to sound like they're from Newcastle. <laughs> no one would understand you. Um, native speakers are the best teachers. Uh, is another 
odd one. Um, I've always felt that I don't wear enough feathers to count as a native. Um, and I certainly don't have enough war paint. Um, there's nothing which says, and there's nothing about being a native speaker of a language which makes you a better teacher of that language. Um, generally speaking, when I do teacher training courses, um, I teach on Cambridge's CELTA program, um, the first thing that I have to do with native speakers is teach them the difference between a noun and an adjective. Because they don't know. Because it's not taught in schools. Because it's not something that they've needed to know. Um, all languages are the same and share a universal grammar. I think we've, uh, we've already mentioned this. Um, but this is a slightly sneakier variant of this. Um, and this is something that I, I get from my colleagues uh, who teach other languages. And they say, yeah, it's OK. You can teach English in this way, because English doesn't have any grammar. But German's different. German, you have to teach like this. German is a very organized, ordered, logical language. Uh, it has to be taught in such and such a way. Um, in much the same way, if you, if you look at how Polish is taught, um, there's an order. And so you first of all learn the nominative, and then you learn the accusative. And then you might learn a little bit of the dative, but only if you're lucky. And so because of this, you can't do things like say, excuse me, is this the right bus stop for such and such a place? You can't, use, you can't do practical things like, can you tell me where the Rinnick is, please? Because you haven't learned that particular conjugation. Because you haven't learned that particular case just yet. Um, there is no difference. You can teach Polish in a way which is connected with use. You can teach French and Spanish and German in much the same way. What there is is there's an entrenched mentality that you have to teach in such and such a way. Another one, language X, for example, the standard example is always German. German is a very logical language. Uh, I think more clearly in German. Everyone who speaks German thinks more clearly. You think in a different way. This is also a myth. There's nothing inherently logical about a language, um, and especially any language that has gender. Gender is one of the most nonsensical things ever. Um, I've never understood why a town, I, and I can never remember if a town hall in French is masculine or feminine, and why it would be either. Um, so just to, to, to sum up, I think, um, language teaching really should be focused on use, and I don't think it is at the moment. Um, therefore, programs should be tailored really to the needs and the uses of the students. So if you're, as I've said, philosophy students, you should be able to argue. Uh, and you should be exposed to people offering the most frustratingly irritating arguments ever in your classes to push you to the point where you want to say something in Polish because you're so angry or you're so frustrated. This is a really good moment in learning a language because this is where you've been pushed to the limits of your capabilities. Okay? If you get to that point where you, want to, you, you say something in your native language, that's great because that means that there's something that you don't know and that means, for me, it's something that I can hopefully teach you. Okay? And finally, the, the teaching of meaning and paralinguistic features should take preference over grammar. Okay? So we should be really stressing things like intonation when it comes to teaching English, okay? rather than uh, obsessing over grammatical structures. Um, the way that you ask for things in English is just as important as the grammatical structures that you use in order to ask for things. The tone of voice that you use is equally important. Um, Polish is a relatively flat language in terms of intonation. So when Polish people speak in English, they can often sound uh, bored, rude, or disinterested. Italian has a very interesting flow. So when Italians speak English, it's very hard to take them seriously. Um, they sound a bit like I must do to you when I speak Polish, or if a Slovakian speaks Slovakian, it sounds slightly funny because it's slightly more up and down. Okay? Um, so really languages and the teaching of language should take this into account. So how do you sound? How do you want to sound? And how can I get you not to offend someone just by asking for something? Okay. I think 
Ah, no, I have a little bit more time. Um, so I just want to give you a quick example from a completely different language that I assume none of you know, I'm hoping. Um, and that's uh, learning Welsh. Um, very important, um, because you'll need it in heaven. It is, of course, God's own language. Um, and the, the example I have for you is, is this one. Um, this is something that you would typically be taught in an introductory book for teaching you Welsh. Um, so you would say, Borada. If you could repeat after me, Borada. 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 Except you're not, are you? I'm Aethan. You are? Magda. Magda. Borada, Aethan, do we? Borada, Magda, do we? Excellent. Sutmai? Probably. <laughs> okay. So again, this is, and this is perhaps the Callan approach. So I would now say, Borada, Aethan, do we? Oh, no, no, no. Aethan, do we? Borada, do we? Ah, okay. Sutmai? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the kind of the Callan approach, okay? So we have, we have a formulaic thing. Now, what I'm on about, this is, this is useful in a way, but think back and have you, have you, it's, it's not often that you say, good afternoon, my name is Aiden, or my name is Dorota, my name is Magda, my name is Christoph, how are you? Okay? But this is something that you will often come about, you come across in pretty much any book that will teach you any language. Okay? You have this as a fixed, a fixed kind of thing. You rarely start conversations in this way. Okay? If you don't know the person that you're talking to, you're much more likely to say something like this. Borada, meithen trigen ich chi Christoph? Excellent. Which basically means in Welsh, uh, good afternoon. Um, are you Christoph? Because often that's how we would begin a conversation, because we don't know. Okay? You would start, if you're meeting someone for the first time, you need to know, how do I ask if this is you or not? Is that, because I've, I've heard there's a description, there's a, yeah? Otherwise, you already know who the person is. So you don't need to ask, and you don't need to say, hi, I'm Aiden. It's a very odd thing to say. A another example, just one quick, quick example, and then we can get on to some questions. Um, would really be uh, with things like colors. So in English book textbooks, in most language textbooks, you'll have, for example, uh, what's your favorite color? Have you ever asked anyone in Polish, what's your favorite color? And if so, did you like the person that you were asking this question to? <laughs> okay. Again, it's, but it's something which is easy to teach, and therefore it's easy to test, so it's often in books. Okay? And the language that's in books and the language that we use are very different things. Um, because we are in the hallowed halls of uh, the law and administration department, there's a, there's a concept from actually law, from American legal realism, which is uh, essentially it refers to law in the books and law in action. Okay? And law in the books is, is the laws that are written down. Okay? These are the hard and fast things. And law in action is actually how laws are implemented and how laws work, and how law is practiced by lawyers. Okay? And it's a very good analogy for English language teaching. Um, there's the English, and there's the language in books, and then there's the language that people actually use. Uh, and I think we need more of the latter and less of the former. Okay? Uh, that's it for me. If you have any questions in English or in Polish, I would say Swahili, but my Swahili is a little rusty. Uh, I'm happy to try to answer them, but I can't promise to. Thank you.